Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gina Wilson, and I'm going to be doing the webinar today. The webinar today is going to be focused on structured cases uh, of the oral board. Before I get started, I want to kind of talk about how you should participate today in the webinar. So when you signed in, if you signed in on your computer, um, then you're going to notice this control box that uh, comes up. And in this control box, it usually will populate either on the right or the left of your screen. Usually mine is on my right. Um, if you want to be able to see the slides better, you can always close the panel by just pressing that arrow. And of course, if you want to unmute yourself or do anything else with the control panel, you can also click on that same orange button to open it back up. So when you are opening up the webinar, um, entering the webinar, it will automatically set you to usually the mics and the speakers uh, for the audio mode. And in this box, this is where you can view, select, and test your audio. Um, and any changes, of course, you need to do is in the audio setup. If you're concerned about connectivity uh, during the broadcast, then you can change it to using your telephone. And uh, all, that, all you have to do is dial in, use the access code, and definitely remember to do the audio pin. Um, because if I wanna take you um, and put you on the hot seat, the only way I can do that is if you have put in that audio pin to have access to the GoToMeeting uh, audio. Um, so sometimes I will use this uh, question box that way to, to submit test questions. Most of the time, especially in small groups like we have today, um, then I can just unmute, uh, unmute you if you put your hand up uh, at any time. Of course, if there is a question of some sort, uh, then you can definitely go ahead and put it in the text box if for some odd reason the functionality of the hand is not working, um, or even if there's a question about connectivity on your part or my part. And over here in that left corner, that's the hand that I was talking about. That way you just raise it, uh, click on it to raise it so that I can unmute you so that you can participate. And uh, most of the time, and just out of transparency, I usually have my box closed, my control box closed, um, but we'll open it periodically or make sure that I see the icon um, that will present if there is a question that is written in a text box. Okay, so what we want to do is focus, like I said, on structured cases. And uh, just a couple of highlights that I want to mention for today. Uh, there is a uh, bulletin, obviously, that's associated with both the qualifying test and the specialty uh, exam. And it is information in there that you definitely need to know um, uh, for your constructions of your case list and, of course, as you prepare for your structured cases and your boards overall. And I will highlight a couple of those things today, but uh, always remember to take a look at that. Um, what I also want to do today is identify some of the common types of questions that you'll get during the structured cases. I know that as you're studying, you're thinking, oh my goodness, they can ask me anything, which is true. Um, they will ask you uh, anything that falls under women's health. Remember, though, you are trained. It's something that you're doing regularly um, in your practice. And there is also a way that they ask them. So I'm going to focus on those common types of questions and how you can approach on answering those, specifically in the structured cases section. And um, as I'm going over those types of questions, I'm going to give a few examples um, of structured cases uh, to allow for participation. So one of the things that I tell everyone is it's important to practice out loud when you are studying for an oral board. And most people don't want to sound bad or they want, want to look bad in front of others, but it's really important uh, that you practice out loud. So I'm going to encourage everyone to participate tonight in the webinar. And I also did some pretty easy questions. And um, no worries, I'm not going to uh, you know, kind of make sure you answer it uh, on the first try. I definitely will coach you through it because uh, we're early in this process and I just want you to make sure that you have a good foundation. If you want to participate, you already know you want to participate, you can go ahead and click on that hand icon now 
Uh, if you want to see a couple of them done first, at any point of the, time, uh, of the webinar, you can click on that hand icon. So this is a little bit busy slide, but it's just um, an example of some of the information that is in your um, examination bulletin for this year. Um, and it was last time it was revised in January. I double checked to make sure that there wasn't a, a, a more recent revision. Um, but one of the things that I want you just to kind of remember is that second paragraph that talks about how the exam is three hours in length. And each hour um, is divided into two sections that are about 30 minutes in length. And obviously each hour is going to be dedicated to either office, OB, or GYN. 30 minutes is gonna be um, them randomly picking questions from your case list and you defending that piece. The other 30 is gonna be from structured cases or simulated cases that are written by the AVOG um, staff. And just so that you know, they don't necessarily, um, from what we understand, they don't necessarily look to see what you don't have. It's just general questions that can be asked by anyone. So it could be information or services that you do provide or topics that you do know, know about. And it also could be information that you don't know about. Um, so definitely uh, we're gonna go over uh, that today. Okay, so this is what I was telling you at the beginning. These are some common types of questions that you could potentially see on the exam for structured cases. Um, they can basically ask you questions to find out how you come up with a differential diagnosis for a particular patient um, when they're presenting to you. Um, then also, um, when you are uh, formulating that differential diagnosis, how do you go about determining the process of evaluating the patient. So just to remind you, that evaluation piece is really going to have the following components. Basically, how you're gonna elicit an appropriate history for that person, um, a physical exam, whether it's comp, uh, a comprehensive uh, physical exam, or whether it's a focused physical exam, usually any laboratory studies that you may have, um, any type of diagnostic testing or imaging, and um, of course, any other procedures, like maybe an endometrial biopsy of some sort, that you have to do on the patient in order to evaluate them. So that is about the evaluation. And, and I know that this sounds maybe elementary, but um, when you're counseling a patient on their options for treatment, that's usually not what you would include in the evaluation piece. That comes in the next section on how you counsel patients. And we're gonna talk about some ways that you can counsel the patient um, which includes giving them all the information about what verbal procedure or medication they have and the pros and cons. Then one of the fourth uh, common types of questions is procedure surgery description. I think this is one of the easiest types of questions that you can potentially get because they basically, you basically can just talk about what you would dictate um, as far as a particular procedure that you've performed. And then there's the single answer only, and those are a little bit more difficult because it's just like you either know it or you don't. Um, I will have a couple of uh, examples, and we can talk about how you can approach it, especially if you are if you don't know uh, what the answer is. And lastly, how do you treat these uh, patients? Uh, what are the treatment options that you provide? And uh, you know, we're going to talk about uh, ways to remember, like a template, uh, so that you will remember how to approach these questions. All right, and I'm clicking to, okay. All right, so we're gonna first start on differential diagnosis. Um, I have somebody that says, when will we get these slides? Let me see, are you not seeing my screen? Here, hold on a second. I am actually going to unmute you, um, Dr. Harani. Because I don't necessarily understand your question. I'm sorry. Help me with this. Yeah. When we uh, get the slides. Hey. Uh, um, do we take our own notes or will we get these slides after the presentation? Oh, okay. So what happens is these uh, webinars are actually recorded. And um, you can have access to the recorded webinars. Um, I would probably get that information directly from Exampro if they have not already given you that as well. Okay. But 
all of the webinars are recorded, so you have access to the recording. Wonderful. Um, as far as the slides, I can find out if they actually give the slides. I know that they haven't asked me for them, but those slides are included in the recording. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we're going to go into the differential diagnosis piece. And in the differential diagnosis piece, um, one of the things that I would recommend is consider doing a template or acronym. Um, and, you know, I know that when you all were studying different types of pathology, you always come up with some sort of acronym or template, um, like um, what are the most common causes of a postoperative seizure? Um, and uh, you remember you talked about the Ws. Um, so same with the smoking secession, you talk about the five A's. So this is when you would really use those templates. That way you can remember and talk that process out. Um, I say avoid the duck syndrome. And what that means by, uh, what I mean by that is if you have a patient um, scenario that they give you and it looks like, let's say, an ectopic, you really think an ectopic, then when they ask you what's your differential diagnosis, then you're stuck in, well, it's got to be an ectopic. Um, same with a duck. If it waddles like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it swims like a duck, it's got to be a duck. But you kind of have to think more like you did when you're doing your internal medicine rounds and think of all of the possible uh, uh, potential diagnosis that the person could have with that presentation. Uh, and lastly, don't forget what is in front of you. Um, if they give you information, pretty much assume that all of the information on that scenario is pertinent information. So make sure that you read it, look at the stem of the question, and really focus on um, you know, what potentially could be the differential diagnosis. All right, so we have three people on. I can uh, see who wants to go first. I will give you a minute to raise your hand or I can just um, click on someone if, and I may do that since it's only three. If you're unable to talk because maybe you have too much background noise, uh, just let me know. You can always mute yourself. All right, so I am going to go with Dr. Jorge um, Tesquero. Are you able to hear me? Hi. Okay, you are you there? Me? I can hear yes. you now. Excellent. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go to the next question. Uh, before I do, are you, can you tell me a little bit about your practice? Oh, yes. Um, well, I'm in kind of uh, a private practice. We are five partners and we also work with residents at the hospital when we take calls. So um, it's kind of like a mix between private practice and, you know, teaching hospital. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Great hybrid. Um, okay, so we're going to go to the next question. You actually have two questions and um, once we go over one, then immediately we'll talk about it. All right, so you have a 36-year-old who is a grab of zero. She is presenting to your office with complaints of pelvic pain uh, for the last three and a half months, and she has a history of infertility. What is your differential diagnosis? Okay, uh, my differential diagnosis will include uh, a PAD, uh, it will include ovarian cyst, it will include um, fibro, uh, uterine leiomyomas, um, it will include some sort of, of uh, intrauterine additions, if anything. Um, You're doing really good. I didn't want to stop you, so I'm going to let you talk because you're doing yeah, you're doing excellent. I'm just trying to figure like think between uh, cause of pelvic pain and also infertility, mm -hmm. um, because if I just focus on pelvic pain per se and without any infertility, do you think that will be okay? Just to say it aloud, or would you break on Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, definitely. You, yeah. Okay, so uh, like 
ovarian cyst, uh, TOAs, mm -hmm. um, it could be uh, non-GYN sources such as, you know, cholecystitis, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, pecky ulcer disease, you know, and pelvic pain could be pretty much everything. Yeah. So yeah, those are, are really good differential diagnoses. And um, so yeah, you did a really good job with thinking first, okay, what are some GYN causes uh, for this person's pain? Um, and even thinking about, okay, and what GYN causes can cause her pain and be related to infertility. I don't know if you actually mentioned endometriosis, but that's a possibility yes. as well. You definitely mentioned some others, which is good. And then you even went outside of the box. You said, okay, and what are some things that could cause her pain that's not related to GYN, um, which could be a gastrointestinal uh, issue, a genital urinary issue. Definitely good job with that. Um, so, uh, and I think irritable bowel syndrome, you mentioned that as well. Um, of course, you know, some psychiatric components um, or neurological and muscular uh, skeletal components can be a part of your differential diagnosis. So that's really good uh, that you did that. And, and one of the, the hints is if you notice in the question, it just said complaints of pelvic pain, and it said for the last three to five months. So uh, that really kind of falls under what the definition of acute or chronic pain, which one would you say? Uh, well, technically it will be acute because it's less than six technically, months. Right, technically it would be acute, um, but again, this is a person that's come in and saying three to five months, you, I mean, three, three and a half months. So you know that sometimes they can present one way and then you talk to them and find out it actually has been uh, eight months or something like that. So yeah. I purposely left that out so you could include both acute and chronic um, causes of pain in your differential diagnosis. Really good. Uh, you ready for the next one? Yes. Okay, here's the next one. All right. So there's a 42-year-old, gravita 2 para 2 has complaints of heavy, occasional irregular periods. She has a history of anemia and is only partially compliant with her prescribed iron tablet. What could be the cause of her abnormal uterine bleeding? Okay, so for this patient, it will be um, uterine leomyoma. It could be endometrial polyp or cervical polyp. Uh, it could be um, some sort of um, cervical neoplasia. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be any um, cervical, um, what do you call it? Um, cervical ectoprion, um, and then non for mm -hmm. the other non-GYN causes could be some sort of underlying um you know um uh, hematological conditions um mm -hmm. thyroid issues some sort of uh prolactin um uh in terms of of her abnormal urine bleeding just focusing on bleeding yeah yeah so, what, what did you say now i'm sorry uh just focusing on the bleeding itself. I know I can go through the pulp coin, but you know, based on the patient, uh, you know, I don't know. My osis will be more like bleeding and you know, pain um, uh -huh. and stuff like that. And you All know, right, very ovulatory, good. ovulatory dysfunctions as well for irregular periods. Good job. So you know, obviously. Tom Cohen, that was actually what I was thinking. Um, so you remember at the beginning, I said that you can consider using your um, acronym. Yep. This is that time when you could use it. And, it, and it's kind of difficult because I know that you're just like, well, um, she's less likely to have adenomyosis because of how she's presenting. Uh, but in the end, this is where it's just like, okay, you kind of have to broaden and it's better just to say more since it's a differential diagnosis, not the official diagnosis. Um, okay. Definitely include all of them. So if you remember palm, Cohen, palm is for structured. It's going to include your polyps, which you mentioned, adenomyosis, 
glioblastomas, malignancy, and hyperplasia. And Cohen is going to be uh, coagulopathies, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic, and not otherwise specified. So, um, very good. This is early in the game, and you're doing a great job. Thanks. What questions do you have? Any? Um, I guess, you know, when you, you asked me the questions, I, you know, thought about the palm cleaning, but then uh, kind of forgot got about it because of the history of anemia and not complying with tablets. And I mm -hmm. tried to, in my mind, narrow the differential from the pod coin. But as you mentioned, once they ask you for a differential diagnosis, I guess it just be brought rather than, you know, try to make the diagnosis while you think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, this is, this is when, and I purposely worded the question so that we would go into our GYN mode of, okay, what is the duck? All right. This looks like a person who has due to fibroids or something yeah. um, less, uh, more common uh, versus uh, least common. Um, you're not probably thinking coagulopathy with this particular history. So, um, so yeah, you're right. Just broaden a little bit with the differential diagnosis. But when they start talking about the evaluation of the patient, then you can kind of narrow it down a little bit um, because you know more about the patient. Right. All right. Good job. Thank you so much for participating. No problem. Okay. So we're going to go to the next set of questions. Um, so one of the questions that I actually have gotten um, when we're doing these, especially early on, is are these questions going to be this easy? And the answer is, uh, yeah, the questions can be this easy. That being said, there is a way that the questions can also be a little bit difficult. I remember when I took um, the exam, one of the questions I was asked was, uh, in my OB structure cases, it was, and I don't remember the gestational age and the Jesus P's as much as, as much as I remember the stem of the question. So it was like a 26-year-old, grab it a one, pair of zero. Um, who presents the triage at 36 weeks with complaints of leaking of fluid. What is your differential diagnosis? So, of course, the um, first thing I'm thinking is, oh, she has a premature, uh, preterm premature rupture of membrane, 36 weeks, ruptures. And then I was like, but they didn't define what fluid was. So the fluid could be amniotic fluid. The fluid could be um, a vaginal discharge. The fluid could be blood. The fluid could be anything. And uh, that's when I realized, oh, this question is a lot harder. So what I did was I focused on all the possible obstetrical causes of leaking, something, some sort of fluid, all of the GYN causes of leaking, some sort of fluid, and then focusing on different uh, organs. So like, what would it be if it was the genital, genital urinary tract and if she was leaking? Was it incontinence? Um, was it a UTI? Um, was she having some sort of vaginal discharge or STI of some sort? So I just kind of went through that piece. So um, recognize the twofold that these are easy questions, but there is a way to still get them wrong because you don't give them the full answer. All right, so let's go into the patient evaluation piece. And one of the things to consider while you're talking about patient evaluation uh, and managing the patient is to don't forget your clinical assessment. So a lot of times when we show the scenarios, uh, when we're doing these mock uh, webinars um, or mock orals, uh, one of the things that people say is, okay, what labs would I order on this patient? And, you know, I need to get an x-ray, I need to get an ultrasound, or I need to do um, an endometrial biopsy or an HSG on the patient. Um, in the end, your history and your physical actually will uh, help you even more to determine what's important uh, to do as far as your um, diagnostic testing. So please don't forget that clinical assessment. Um, now, that being said, you don't have to say, I'm going to do a history and physical, and then just give that blanket answer of all the components of a history and all the components of the physical. Definitely look at that scenario. Think about what is the most important information I need to know about that person's history. What's the most pertinent information that I need to know um, or examine on that patient's physical to help me um, with the evaluation piece? So uh, just think about that. And then lastly, use the same template every time. 
history, physical, labs, imaging, other diagnostic testing. And if you do that, you won't leave anything out, okay? Okay, so who would like to participate? Jorge already did, but you are welcome to participate as many times today as you would like. I will give you a few minutes, whomever, to raise your hand, and then um, we'll just see who wants to get on the hot seat. All right, so we have Dr. Harani. How are you? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's you are question. fine. <laughs> Trust me, you'll be fine. There's the, the good thing is there's no real wrong way of doing this. It's too lie, so you have plenty of time. Okay, are you ready for your scenario? Yes, ma'am. First one, here it goes. You have a 37-year-old G0 who presents to the office with complaints of pelvic pain for the last three months. Notice that this is kind of similar to the last one. Um, and she has a history of infertility. Discuss your evaluation process. So basically, they're asking you, this patient's coming in for pelvic pain, and she said she's had it for three months, and a part of her medical history includes infertility. But this is just the basic. And notice that she's 37 and she's not uh, ever been pregnant. So what, how would you evaluate this patient? Um, obviously first I do take a good history um, and do a physical exam. Um, good. Once we uh, do the history and physical, I might obtain um, uh, some labs. Uh, because of her age being 37, I get an anti-malarian hormone to see if her ovarian reserve because there's a con uh, okay concern for infertility. Um, mm -hmm. I'd get a uh, <clears throat> uh, CBC um, as well. And um, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go labs here. Yeah, and you could include labs and, of course, any other diagnostic testing, oh, maybe, so if you're going to do something else. Order. So, yeah, I'm at, for imaging, I get a, uh, a pelvic transvaginal ultrasound uh, to make yeah. sure uh, structural concerns there. Um, and then uh, um, <clears throat> at least I'd start with uh, those right there, making sure we have enough ovarian reserve, um, making sure we've done an STI uh, uh, workup um, as well. Uh, um, an HSG in addition to a transvaginal ultrasound to make sure the uh, tubes are uh, patent. Um, and then, uh, we, and, <clears throat> and because of a history of possible uh, uh, public pain, trying to assess um, if there were um, uh, concerns for endometriosis or mm -hmm. if there were concerns for uh, PCOS, um, um, and, and at least going from there. Yeah, so you notice the more you talk, you realize how broad this question oh, actually yeah. is. Oh, yeah. As soon as I start saying yeah, that, this is kind of kind of... Yeah, it gets tougher sometimes. So, yeah, so great. You did really good about talking about the fact that you do a history and a physical exam. Um, that clinical assessment is so important. And the only thing I would probably add is maybe talking about something pertinent in the history. Uh, one of the things, w anytime somebody presents with pain, I think of, um, and I don't know if you knew this acronym, is it the PQRST, um, talking about the pain. Um, so basically, um, what makes it better? What precipitates it? What makes it worse? What's the quality of the pain? Does it radiate? Um, have you done anything or taken any medication or treatment so that um, it makes it better? The physician, you know, those are just some basics about the pain itself. Um, that's the only thing that I probably would have added more. And of course, any pertinent negatives or positives on the pelvic exam, what you're looking for. And yeah, doing a lab studies, imaging your diagnostic procedures, definitely important uh, to do for these patients. If she was a person that looked more like a chronic pelvic pain, um, have you ever uh, gone to the International Pelvic Pain Society page? It's pelvicpain.com. No, I have not gone on that. It's a great, check it out. It's really great. All of y'all that are on there, check it out. It's pelvicpain.org. Pelvic and they have a pelvic pain assessment form 
for you to fill out um, with the patient. The patient takes it home, and it's really long, it's exhaustive. The patient takes it home, and you also will view it and uh, uh, fill it out as a, the provider. But it actually includes a multidisciplinary approach to coming up with what's going on with this patient. So not just GYN issues, it rules out like interstitial cystitis and everything. So um, that's also something to look at um, as you're studying because it kind of keeps some things in the forefront of your head when you are um, talking about how you would evaluate a patient. All right, but really good job with what you did so far. And the FTI, it's very good to add that piece. Uh, so okay, the, so here's the, go ahead. the template. Um, in other words, when we do the H and P labs imaging di diagnostic, if um, mm -hmm. if imaging is the first thing that comes up uh, to my mind, mm -hmm. I still need to stick with that template and make sure I got the lab before the imaging. Before the is that the way to present? So yeah, so I, that's a really good question. Actually, um, I think in general, the in real life imaging um, or diagnostic testing may come to our mind first because in real life we're actually sitting in front of the patient and we're already getting the history piece um, so you wouldn't really have to speak to that you're already kind of looking at the physical exam um, because you're trying to assess is the patient wincing um, grimacing while they're talking so you're all we're already assessing doing a clinical assessment in real life the problem with that is when you're taking your orals you have to speak to it um, so I would definitely say, you know, after the history and physical exam to rule out any pertinent positive or negative, I would definitely uh, go to lab study because I know that it's going to, you know, give me more information about this particular um, disease process. Um, I think as you practice, though, you'll find that it'll be easier to speak to history and physical. You'll be able to train your brain a little bit to, although the lab picks up or the imaging, I'm sorry, the lab stands out in your brain or imaging stands out in your brain, you can put it in a parking lot for a second while you at least speak to the history and physical piece. Okay. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next one. So this is very similar to the last one as well. This is a 49-year-old G3P3 that has complaints of heavy occasional irregular bleeding. She has a history of anemia and is on iron supplementation, but still feels tired. How would you evaluate this patient? And, you know, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to ask you to try to stick with the template and just focus on history and physical, including some of those pertinent positives that you, or the, those need to knows in the history and those need to knows in the physical. Okay. Um, so I'll take a history and physical, and when I talk about the history, I uh, assess how long this has been going on for. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if they can describe what heavy means, how many pads, uh, for how Good. many, how many pads, pad, and for how many dates. Um, in terms of the irregular irregularity, how long that's been going on for? Um, mm -hmm. Was there any medication that was taken to make the heaviness of the bleeding better? Um, did anything mm -hmm. make it uh, much worse? Um, was she on any medications while, um, any contraceptives or anything else while this was happening? Um, mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> how long uh, the patient's known, um, uh, how long was she put on iron supplementation? Um, mm -hmm. In addition to feeling tired, are there any other symptoms of uh, headache, palpitation, shortness of breath? Good. Uh, Go ahead, I didn't mean to stop you. I was just getting oh, excited for you because you were doing okay. a great job. <laughs> and, uh, uh, from there, um, uh, we would, uh, uh, do after history and physical, um, you know, get some lab work, including a CBC. And because the patient's been on iron, um, uh, get a ferritin, uh, TABC, uh, and uh, iron level to assess um, how well uh, the patient has done being on the iron uh, supplementation there as well. Um, and also, uh, because of the uh, irregular heaviness, um, uh, see what the patient's uh, BMI is uh, to assess mm -hmm. if we need to uh, do an endometrial also biopsy, um, also get a, a transvaginal ultrasound um, to assess if there's uh, any specific cause, structural causes, such as either leomyoma, um, um, 
there are for any concerns um, uh, for structural causes of the bleeding as well. Wow. So how did you feel when you were doing that? Uh, a little bit better with the, uh, the H&P and knowing that, you know, we've got some uh, uh, history of anemia with iron, I feel a little bit uh, easier with the iron deficiency anemia. Um, where I struggle then is, is uh, how to describe imaging and diagnostics from there. So. Yeah, no, I thought you did a really good job. And it's interesting because a lot of people are like, well, I don't, I wouldn't do all of this stuff all at one time um, for this patient. I would probably just focus on the history and physical and depending on what that says, then I would determine the next. And you can actually say that when you're actually presenting to say, you know, I would do a clinical assessment on those, that patient. And, you know, if I'm seeing that a person has leiomyomas or enlarged uterus, I would be concerned about uh, fibroids. So I would definitely add imaging in my um, evaluation. You can kind of speak to that. And, uh, and I like the fact that you noticed the person was tired. So you just kind of want to get an idea. Are they hemodynamically stable? Because that's going to be important, especially if they're anemic, checking the ferritin. So I thought you did a really good job with that piece, um, with that. And, you know, Dr. Jorge already had the question about the differential diagnosis of a person with, uh, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding, but sometimes they'll ask you all of the questions all at one time. They'll give you a scenario and they'll say, what is your differential diagnosis? How would you evaluate the patient? And how would you treat the patient? And then they just kind of stare at you while you ramble. Um, so in those cases, make sure that how you're evaluating the patient is ruling out what's on your differential diagnosis list. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so but very good job on, on, on that. I thought you did a really good job, definitely on the second one. Do you have any questions before we get to the next one? Mm -hmm. okay, and all good the, job. The way we practice this, is it by using the practice bulletins and organizing information from the practice bulletins as sort of the, the basis of how we're going to answer this? Is that so? Uh, yeah, so that's a that's a good way to kind of reinforce um, the information that you need to know by going to the practice bulletin, especially because that information in the treatment piece is going to change as you get closer. Um, but that being said, uh, it's it's almost let me say this: your case list that you have has pretty much all of the same information that could appear on the structured case list. Um, even if you don't necessarily, let's say, um, have a person who has a coagulopathy, um, but you have a person that you did a hysterectomy on in your GYN cases for abnormal uterine bleeding, then one of the questions could be, what are the um, you know, differential diagnosis for the patient's abnormal uterine bleeding? And, um, and how would you manage if the patient had a coagulopathy um, but needed a hysterectomy? So those questions could come up. Um, one thing that we tell people, of course, is, you know, look at your case list and come up with some questions uh, on your case list uh, about all aspects of the cases. Um, and then, of course, you know that uh, exam pro offers mock uh, orals, uh, but it's important to do as many mock orals as possible. Um, because practicing out loud is key. Did that help at all? Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for participating. So we're going to go to the next set of questions. And I'm looking at the time. So um, I'm probably going to go through this next one really quickly. Um, and then I'm going to go to the next set and ask if there's anybody that wants to participate, because this one's pretty easy. This just has to do with procedures and surgery descriptions. And basically all you have to do is state what you dictate. Um, what you also have to avoid doing is discussing preoperative uh, details or consent information in the details. And be careful with describing procedures that you don't perform. Um, they may ask you, you know, how do you perform an amniocentesis and you are a gyne uh, gyne oncologist? And amniocentesis, the last time you saw one is in residency. Uh, you can just say, this is not something that I do in my current practice, but this is the understanding of how uh, this procedure would be done. And speak to it on a high level. Uh, that way they know that you still understand what needs to be 
uh, or the expectation of what needs to be uh, known as a generalist. Um, but at the same time, you're letting them know, hey, this is not what I do uh, regularly uh, on my uh, exam on my um, for my patients. And actually, I said that I was going. You know, this is this is such an easy one. I'm going to allow. Uh, anyone, first of all, to go ahead and raise their hand for this one, because this one's kind of easy. I'm telling you in advance, uh, in all transparency, this is easy. Uh, who would like to uh, participate or try this one out? I'll give you a second. All right. Dr. Jorge. Yes. Are you there? Okay. Yes. All right. Yes, I'm here. So let's go to this one. Pretty easy. Um, as long as you do GYN. And I believe that's what you, you mentioned that you did. 37 year old, yeah. pretty similar, that comes into the office with complaints of pelvic pain for the last three months, has a history of infertility. After you've done a complete evaluation, you schedule her for a diagnostic laparoscopy. The question is, discuss how you access the intra-abdominal cavity when you're performing the laparoscopic procedure. How do you get into the belly when you're performing a laparoscopic procedure? And just think, what would you dictate? Okay, so in, in, for this question, it is something that I will mention uh, uh, since the patient is being prepped or Patient is already prepped, time on is done, and I'm ready, you know, to call for the instruments. So um, it's interesting that you say that for this one, um, it's so specific. They just want to know um, a portion of the procedure. But there are some times when they'll ask you, for example, how describe how you would place an IUD. And in those cases, when they're asking just in general the entire procedure, then I would say after the patient has been consented, positioned and sterilely prepped and draped, I would, and then go straight into the actual procedure piece. Um, if you want to do that piece with the diagnostic laparoscopy, you can, uh, especially since it's early, um, you know, entering the abdominal cavity is early in that process, you can definitely do that as well. Okay. So it's your choice. It's your choice. Yeah. So uh, I will just say, like, I'm a patient is already prepped. Time on is done. So what I will do is, um, I will say, um, so I will make sure the uh, belly button is prepped. I will call for um, Alice clamps to a very the umbilical bottom, and make mm -hmm. an incision with a five millimeters, uh, five millimeter, uh, in the midline. And I will elevate the um, um, abdominal tissue. Um, the five millimeter trocar will be inserted 90 degrees. Um, and then I will connect um, the uh, uh, gas and the obturator and the camera. And I will look for. Uh, into the uh, intra-abdominal pressure to be less than uh, 10. Once that is done, I'm almost, uh, I'm sure I'm in the abdominal cavity and I will, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, continue with the surgery. Okay, uh, so just to clarify a little bit, uh, cause you said that you would do an incision in the midlines. Are you talking about the midline, the infra-umbilical incision or? Um, in the umbilical, in the umbilical, in the umbilical okay. bottom. Uh, yes. Gotcha. And then when you're actually talking about entering or placing the trocar, do you place the trocar under direct guidance of the camera? Because you know how they have the trocars where you can put the camera in and you can place it at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and then insufflate, or do you do it um, insufflate first? Um, yes. After placing uh, the varus needle. So it is my practice. I tend not to use the various needle at first. Uh -huh. uh, I will just do um, the um, direct visualization of the uh, entry. 
Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, that's exactly how you would uh, talk about your practice. Um, what access locations would you use? Is it umbil uh, umbilicus? Is it um, left upper quadrant? Um, and then how would you get it access uh, through the peritoneum? Is it going to be your open or Hassan, or is it going to be the close with the varus needle? And like you said, there's some that do the direct visualization with the camera. Um, and this is just, you know, kind of, this is an example intro with using the varus needle. Um, but you can just change this however you would after inf uh, infiltration of uh, the pubicane of uh, solution in the sub-umbilical area, I would make a 5 to 10 millimeter incision with a number 11 blade. Then I would insert the uh, varus needle into the peritoneal cavity, blah, 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 blah. So that's a way to do it. I think how you started off with uh, making, you know, saying that the patient is sterilely prepped and draped is fine. There's some that I'll say make sure that the table is even uh, and parallel to the ground. So however you mm -hmm. want to do it, that's definitely fine. That's what makes this so easy. So let me ask you, and this is another question, uh, the patient that had the irregular bleeding with a history yep. of anemia and iron supplementation, you determine that she does need an endometrial biopsy. So this okay. question is, you know, office kind of based, how would you perform an endometrial biopsy on this patient? Okay. So um, first I'm gonna prep uh, and position the patient in a, in a lithotomy position. And then I'm going to let the patient know they're going to start the procedure. I'm going to insert mm -hmm. the speculum uh, in the vagina. I'm going to look for the uh, cervix. And uh, I'm going to clean the cervix with betadine. Of course, I will ask the patient if she has any allergies before I will do that. Um, mm -hmm. And after that, I will insert um, the, um, the uh, oh my God, I forgot the name, the uterine. Um, to measure the, the length of the uterus. I forgot the name of it. Yeah. Um, okay. So I will, yeah, I, I will insert that. And uh, once I know what's the uh, depth of the uterus, I will insert the uh, uterine pipel. Uh, if I'm okay. not able to insert the pipel, then I will have to use the adenaculum. Um, I will let the patient know that she might feel a pinch uh, if I need to use mm -hmm. a tenaculum, and I will place mm -hmm. in the anterior lip of the cervix, I will retract slightly if the uterus is antiverted. If the uterus is retroverted, I will place a tenaculum in the posterior lip, um, and then I will, you know, pass through the external internal os with the pipel. Once I'm inside the uterine cavity, I will retract the lower part of the pipel and start with the scraping um, until I, you know, get some sampling. And it is just my clinical practice that I will pass the pipel twice just to get enough tissue. Uh, after I finish, I will remove the um, uh, tenaculum. I will look for any um, bleeding in the cervix. If I encounter any bleeding, I will put some pressure for a minute. If the bleeding persists, I might use some sildenitrate. Um, and after that, uh, and after it's hemostatic, I will, you know, uh, remove the rest of the instruments. Very good. How did you feel while you were answering that? Uh, well, once I'm, uh, I was more into the, the procedure, I will just kind of like remember what I do at the office and everything kind of like flows. But the beginning is, I, I feel it's slightly, you know, you feel a little bit nervous about, you know, what should I start first? And then I remember, oh, I didn't ask the patient if she had any allergies. So that's what I came back. But once you are into the, the, the motions, it's just, you know, this is what I will do next. It's just a matter of saying it out loud. I agree. I think you did a really good job with talking about that procedure. You definitely felt more comfortable with this one. And maybe it was just the practice uh, since it was your second one. Uh, but you did excellent yeah. at just really focusing on this is how I do the endometrial biopsy. Um, so good job with that. Um, you actually didn't make the mistakes that a lot of people make um, where they start describing um, the procedure with, so I make sure that I counsel the patient on X and I make sure that the patient has all the questions because that's not what they're asking. They just want to know how you perform something. And the other thing is um, 
you didn't talk about your evaluation because sometimes they're just going to flat out ask you a question about the procedure and they're not going to ask you about the evaluation piece. So some people will say, oh, well, I just want to make sure that an ultrasound was done first and, you know, kind of tell the examiner that the procedure is indicated. Um, in those cases, you don't, if they're asking you how do you perform something, you don't even have to tell them what the indications are because there's an assumption that it's indicated and you just have to talk about it. So really good job in uh, how you did that. Thank you for that. No problem. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so very good. It's so interesting because when I was asked um, and when I was taking my board, I was asked um, how do you do a, um, a biophysical profile? You know, so I started talking about the components and everything and they were just like, no, how would you actually do a biophysical profile? And I was kind of confused and I was just like, wait, I just gave them all the components. But then I said, you know what, I would make sure that the patient um, is in a lithotomy position, uh, you know, slightly raised, um, a leftward tilt, make sure that I can see her belly, and then of course all the quadrants of her belly, make sure that I put a gel, uh, ultrasound gel on her belly, and making sure that the ultrasound transducer um, is uh, uh, perpendicular to the plane of her body, and then I just literally talked about how I would do it, and I couldn't believe that they were asking me that particular question, but I once I realized they wanted to know exactly, I guess, um, the logistics of how it was done, not necessarily the components, and I was able to answer it uh, the way they wanted. So the single answer, this is a harder one. This is one of those, you either know it or you don't. It's okay to do an educated guess, but your guess, if it's educated, it doesn't need to be random guess. And for, you know, definitely I wouldn't, I don't think that it's wise to make up any statistics. So. I'm going to do this really quickly, and this one uh, just has to do with a patient, same patient who has the public examination, um, and for the last three months, and she's had the infertility, and you're concerned about the diagnosis of depression. So the question is, what percentage of women live with or seeking care for chronic pelvic pain meet the criteria for major depression? So when, if you don't know the percentage, just think about it. Think about um, what they're asking about. These patients who are continually going through chronic pelvic pain, not necessarily what this person has by definition, but they're constantly waking up with pelvic pain. Um, but also remember, this is not being a depressed mood. It is major depression. So the question is, would you think that it's more than a third, more than 50%, more than 75%, or 100%? And in general, when you're answering questions like this, it's usually okay to say between 20 to 30 percent, um, because that's actually a significantly uh, significant uh, uh, um, statistic. In this case, it's 12 to 33 percent. It is a range, and answering in a range is fine as long as you're close to the answer. So if you said 30 oh, percent or so, then that would be close. Or even if you said about 20 percent, that would still fall in the range. Um, now, in case you were reading this question and you weren't sure what the answer is, this is actually attached to the Chronic Public Pain uh, Practice Bulletin uh, that came out last year of March in 2020. Um, if chronic pain is not where you feel you're most confident or you may have missed this answer, then definitely look at this. And uh, Dr. Harani, this is when the practice bulletins really come into play. If you're doing mock oral, if you're answering questions and you're recognizing there are areas that you really need help or you need to reinforce, then going and looking up your wrong answer in the practice bulletins of committee opinions is a great way uh, to do that. Uh, it has a little bit of everything, how you treat, how you evaluate, and some of the pathophysiology and etiologies and incidents of the, uh, of the disease process. Here's another example for a patient who's coming in for heavy, irregular periods um, and on iron and feeling tired. She also has, I just added this, has a family history of bleeding disorders. Now, the actual question does not, you know, I threw that in, but the actual question is just a general question about the general population. So be careful not to look at the scenario and then try to merge the scenario with the question because they aren't always connected. 
So the question is, what percentage of women, not necessarily the woman in the scenario, what percentage of women present with abnormal uterine bleeding um, have an underlying bleeding disorder? Now, if you don't know that answer right off the bat, um, then you can kind of think of your practice and say, how many of these patients have I seen with von Willebrand's or any other uh, underlying bleeding disorder? And it's usually um, on the lower side of the percentage. So you, I wouldn't expect you to say 80% if you didn't know the answer. And for this, it's one of those ranges again, up to 20%. Um, is found to have an underlying bleeding disorder. And up to 20% can actually mean 12, can mean 15, but it's up to 20%. Now, if you did not know the answer to this, I would encourage you to take a look at that practice bulletin um, in, um, that was reaffirmed this year. It's the Diagnosis of Abnormal Uterine Bleeding in Reproductive Aged Women. Um, this was number 128 in July of 2012, but reaffirmed this year. Okay, and then the last set of questions is treatment and counseling. And um, I see that uh, Dr. Ritchie, I'm gonna unmute you and I'm gonna see if we can find where you are because I know you're having some connectivity issues. So let me see if I can unmute you. And for some odd reason, it is not letting me unmute you. Let me try this one. All right, good. Let me try this one and see if this one will let you connect. I think you got a connection. Are you there? And it looks like I got the green microphone. So I'm just waiting to hear from you. Okay, and it dropped off. So um, what I would suggest, Dr. Ritchie, and you know, what I'll do is I'll send you a quick message in the chat and to see if you wanna connect through your telephone. Um, connecting through your telephone and using the audio pin, even, you know, keep your computer connected, um, but definitely try to connect through the telephone and see if that helps as well. I'm going to try to unmute you again, and let's see if we can get you. Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yay! Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. That was I'm painful. I'm <laughs> excited. <laughs> okay, so let's hurry up and get through this question before you drop off. Um, all right, so this is about treatment and counseling. And this has to do with, you know, if they ask you a question about um, treating a patient, consider all treatment options, whether it would be the best um, or not quite as good for the patient, just consider talking about it. And when you're answering the question, think about talking about your non-invasive first, all the way to the most invasive um, as far as the treatment. Okay, so here's the question. Same patient with this pelvic pain, 37-year-old, she's zero. And I changed it. She has pelvic pain for the last eight months. She has infertility. She has a history of fibromyalgia and is taking Norco, prescribed by another provider. So how do you counsel this patient about opioid usage for the treatment of chronic pelvic pain? So this is a very specific question and you're treating this patient, you're gonna counsel this patient on opioid usage for chronic pelvic pain. Um, have you ever treated a patient like this before? Me? Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm oh. actually a chronic pelvic pain specialist. <laughs> oh, yay! Uh, you got this one in the bag. Okay, uh, go ahead, I hope go so. for it. I, I usually uh, counsel patients that the um, evidence for use of opioids in the treatment and management of chronic pelvic pain is very limited. Um, mm -hmm. I empathize with them and let them, you know, I understand that what, how their, what, um, what their pain, what they must be going through in terms of their pain. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to do an evaluation before, you know, we decide on 
a treatment plan for you. Um, mm -hmm. Opioid use in general has risks, mm -hmm. including nausea, vomiting, sedation, um, addiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably what I would answer. Okay, very yeah. good. So um, some of the things that I really appreciate you doing with this patient and counseling them is a pro. You First of all, you empathize with them. Um, you didn't come at them and just, you know, say, but I understand this is a tough diagnosis to have. It's tough to even try to manage. Um, and you recognize where that patient is and their frustration. And then it's also a reality check. Um, the opioids um, don't necessarily treat what's going on. It may manage your pain and just temporarily, but not really treat it. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing that I would probably change is you did talk about you would evaluate. And technically, that's a different question. Gotcha. They only want to know how you counsel them because their uh, understanding is already that you evaluated them. Um, but you did go on into talking about some of the risks that are associated with it. So very good. This is actually a template that I consider when you're counseling a patient about a treatment or a surgery is talking about the indications, you know, from the get go. Um, is this even indicated to have opioid uh, treatment uh, for a chronic patient, a chronic pelvic pain? Is it recommended? Is it not recommended? Um, it doesn't address the cause. You kind of actually spoke to that. Uh, benefits mm -hmm. and the risk and which one uh, uh, will outweigh which, whichever one. And sometimes the risk will outweigh the benefits for this. Some of the complications associated with it, um, which will include, like you said, some adverse medication, medical uh, medication effects. And of course, overdose and tolerance and then some of the alternatives. So that's the only thing that I, to be honest, I think all of us forget to talk about mm -hmm. um, when we're actually taking the boards. In real life, we talk about it. Um, you'll say, hey, you know, there are these opioids, there are all these um, other options. So these are some of the alternatives that you can talk about. And definitely consider it, even if you know that most likely the person is going to say no. When you take your boards, they just want to know that you know what those alternatives are and you provide that information for your patient. So that makes sense? Yes. I have a question. Are we allowed yeah. to ask? Uh, clarifying questions at oral boards. So, for example, if we're presented with a patient scenario, uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for example, this one that you just presented, what if I had a question about, like, you know, what has this patient tried before? Or are you just mm. given what you're given? And then you just have to make a generalized uh, answer, general answer. Y yeah. So you can definitely ask clarifying questions as long as the clarifying questions kind of align with the question that they're asking you. So for here, they're already into the treatment. They're like, how do you counsel this patient on opioid usage? To even ask about, well, when, you know, does she have a history of drug abuse? But yeah. Then you, you're less likely to get any type of anything that's clarified. Uh, you know, if you ask, uh, basically, um, is this the first time I'm counseling the patient, then they may say, yeah, this is the first time you're counseling the patient, because they're really not, you know, giving you additional information. Gotcha. That's actually what makes some of these structured cases difficult, because they can be so broad. Um, okay. But it also makes it really easy, because you can kind of make up what you want. You can actually say, now, this is how I would counsel the patient if I knew that they had X. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, even if they didn't have, even if they didn't say it. Okay, last one. This has to do with the patient that you've been seeing with their regular periods on iron supplementation, who has this, um, you know, symptomatic anemia, it looks like. So on evaluation, she has been diagnosed with uterine fibroids as a cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. And this is going to be a hard question, but you can do it. I can feel it in my spirit. <laughs> so discuss what are the treatment options for fibroids? And if you remember uh, one of the things that I was telling you before we started the scenarios, when you're talking about treatment options, a way to remember all of your options is start with non-invasive and go all the way to invasive or definitive treatment. Are ready when you are. All right, her treatment options include expectant management, meaning doing nothing, 
Um, yeah. It includes medical management, which would involve uh, hormonal contraception. Um, I would determine if the patient is interested in future childbearing. I know 49 is really um, mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. end of it, mm -hmm. but I think it's important to address that with a patient. Uh, so there's mm -hmm. surgical options, which include myomectomy, which are removal of just the fibroids themselves, a hysterectomy, which would be removal of the uterus and the fibroids. Uh, mm -hmm. She can consider referral to interventional radiology for uterine artery embolization. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other providers who perform laparoscopic ablation of the fibroids. Good. Very good. How did you feel answering that? Oh, good. <laughs> Gyne is definitely <laughs> my strong point. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Uh, very good answer. Um, so again, um, starting with the least invasive basis to the definitive treatment, you definitely did that. You talked about the medical therapy and, of course, procedures that are going to be less invasive and all the way to uh, the more invasive procedures. Now, you did something, but I'm going to actually give you a hand on how to get around it. You basically, you said, um, I would ask about her childbearing. So, yeah. again, that is a question of evaluation. Gotcha. So, it's expected that you already know that, but this is a way to kind of get around it. Uh, after you say, you know, you could observe, you can say, if the patient um, has desires for future children or wants to continue uh, with childbearing, then this is the treatment that I would, uh, uh, the options that I would give her. If the patient is done with family planning or they in their family planning, they're completely done with all childbirth, this is the route that I would give it. So you kind of like make your own decision tree. Uh -huh. without saying, I would go back and ask to see if she has X. Just go ahead and tell them what's the treatment that we you do if the person who was done with childbearing versus the treatment if they weren't done. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that way That's you don't a good have way to, to approach it. You know, yeah, you don't ask. have to go back and evaluate. And you're giving all, yeah, you're, yeah, you'll be giving all of the options. But the way I think that you answered it was perfect. Very okay. good. Very good job. Thank you for participating. I'm glad we were able to get you on the, on the I line. know. I was like, oh. All right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I know that we are past our time. I apologize, but I wanted to make sure that I got through all of the six types of questions. I just want to remind you all not to forget mock orals are highly recommended. Um, you'll hear Dr. Shamroth say, best way to practice for an oral exam is to talk out loud, not to read and not to write. It's an oral exam. Um, as you know, Exam Pro offers mock orals. You'll have those opportunities to get it from them. And of course, if you have colleagues um, or you have uh, uh, any um, family members, you can give them your case list and say, hey, ask me this question. Or you can give them a question book and say, hey, ask me this question and see if I say the right answer. You just want to get in the habit of talking out loud. Um, templates and patterns help you hardwire your responses. So even, like I uh, said uh, earlier to Dr. Harani, even if you think of lab or you think of imaging first, if you try those templates, it helps you to hardwire a way to answer the question in a very organized fashion. So just definitely consider it as you're practicing. And you know, focus your studies when you're reading on what you're getting wrong, not in what you don't know. You don't necessarily have to reread what you already know. Um, Dr. Rishi, I don't know about pelvic pain for you. It sounds like you already know it. Definitely read some basics of it, but sounds like your focus will be on obstetrics. So just consider that uh, as you're practicing. Take advantage of the webinars. Thank you so much for participating and getting in the hot seat. Trust me, the more you do it, the better you'll get. And uh, remember, statistically, majority of people will pass, pass. So always think positively as you're approaching uh, this test coming up very soon. So we, I am going to go ahead and end the webinar. Remember to touch bases with Exam Pro. They can tell you exactly how you can access the webinar recordings um, that are done uh, this month and, of course, in the future months, um, especially if you uh, have to miss one for any reason, okay? All right. Again, thanks for uh, participating tonight. This webinar is over.